Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. So grateful and so thankful for the time that you've given us to study your word together. So keenly aware of just how little we know. I just ask that the Holy Spirit be our teacher, guiding us into all truth, sealing to our hearts that which is true and only true filtering out all the error, all the foolishness, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're continuing on in our study in Colossians, verse by verse. We're in the third chapter, uh, about chapter 3, verse 6. I want to thank you all uh, right up front here, first of all, for uh, your continued uh, uh, involvement uh, with me in these studies. I want you all to know just how much you encourage me and how much you give me uh, strength and the um, everything that it takes to continue on. I, I understand that uh, much of these truths is unpopular. I also understand that uh, much of this truth is new to, to many of you. Uh, I also understand that much of this truth is uh, is truth that you've been used to hearing, but you haven't found elsewhere. Just want you to know how how much Sue and I appreciate your continued support and all of your love and all of your prayers. And I ask that you continue to pray for us as we move forward through these studies. There are many controversial issues that seem to rise to the surface in our study of this epistle. Uh, just as in Ephesians and Romans, now and now in Colossians, many truths that, that seem to, to go against the grain of modern teaching. I think you're going to find in this video that this video is going to uh, point out just uh, how true that is. I ask you to bear with me. This is probably one of the the toughest videos uh, that I've had to the toughest studies to prepare for a video that I've ever had to, to wrangle with, and uh, for obvious for the obvious reasons that'll come out in the video. So far in in our study through this epistle, we've we've seen in beautiful and precise language the person in the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if I just stopped right there and I didn't say anything else, it would set this epistle apart from much of what is so-called Christian teaching today. Jesus Christ, who is not an offspring of God, not something less than God, nor a part of God, but He's God Almighty incarnate in human flesh. God became man and dwelt among us. This is one of the things that really shook me to my core back when I came to know the Lord back in the late 80s. That God had become man and dwelt among us. The God of very God becoming flesh. I think there's something remarkable in the fact that He, and we are approaching the Christmas season, that God of very God became incarnate in human flesh. The righteous, sinless Son of God became man. And we as Christians stand before God wholly unblameable and unreprovable in His sight. And folks, if that doesn't excite you, nothing will. We're talking about God incarnate in human flesh, the one who spoke the worlds into existence, the one that holds it all together. And we were introduced to His finished work that through the blood of the cross, He has created a union between us and God. He's made us... Uh, he's made peace. We stand wholly unblameable and unreprovable in His sight. Not something that you'll hear from most pulpits, but true nevertheless. And that is the gospel of grace. It's the gospel of grace. This ministry is determined to continue putting forth. It's, it's what ought to be taught. 
we preach a person, not a thing. I think you can pretty much separate, you know, a good ministry from a bad ministry by what it teaches. Are they teaching a person or are they teaching stuff, a thing, things? Are they telling you what you ought to do or, or are they telling you what he did? Which leads to what we do. A proper understanding of, of who Christ is and what he's done for us doesn't lead to, it doesn't neglect the, the, the man, in, you know, uh, aspect of it, the believer's responsibility aspect of it. It actually leads to that, a proper understanding and a, and a proper working out of that. So we've seen that he has a great conflict for us, his concern being that we might be comforted and, and realize that all of the treasures and the wisdom of knowledge are hidden in Christ, not something that we seek for or work for or attempt to attain, but we have them in Christ and that we are complete in Him. In this second chapter, it, it ended with the fact that law will not work. We died with Christ from the elements of the world system, and the Holy Spirit asks, why as though you are deriving your life from that system, are you subject to ordinances, touch not, taste not, handle not? You know, oh, but if you're not subject to ordinances, then you're open to license. You'll just live however you want. I've heard that a thousand times, if I've heard it once. And somehow the Christian in environment has to set the rules whereby you live your Christian life. Yet the Word of God makes it abundantly clear that the life that is yours is Christ, not rules and regulations. Why do you submit to these things? And then the third chapter begins, since law won't work, you've been raised with Christ. You know, there isn't some hope that, that maybe, possibly, somehow you'll be raised with Christ. There isn't the concept that, well, you could be raised with Christ if you decided to be, you wanted to be. Anybody who stands up and says, you know, I got some fantastic news for you. You know, you could be raised with Christ if you want to be is not biblical. The third chapter doesn't, doesn't start by saying that you could be raised with Christ if you want to be, if you just receive, if you just believe, if, if you just accept, if you just, you know, put any conditions that you want to there, you know, that the ecclesiastical system puts in there. And then you could be raised with Christ. The truth is that you are raised with Christ, and for a chapter and a half, the Holy Spirit has been hitting us with contrasts. In the second chapter, we found that we were rooted and built up in Him, yet we could be spoiled by the philosophies of the world system, the rudiments of the world. We have the contrast. We died from the old life. We died with Christ. We were buried with Him. And the contrast is that we are alive in Him, having been risen to a new life. We have the contrast of being dead in sin and quickened in Christ. We have the contrast of those decrees that were against us and those decrees being taken out of the way so that they are no longer against us. We have the shadow of things that would come uh, and that which has come, the body of Christ. We have the things which they have seen, people have seen, versus the head the Lord Jesus Christ. The chapter ends with the contrast between the rudiments or elements of the world system and being risen with Christ. Those contrasts are important to see. It would be very easy, folks, it'd be so easy to spend the next several weeks or months, you know, me talking about how you ought to do what you ought to do to get victory over these things in your life. That's what everybody else does. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. 
you know, the, the sermon normally comes out something like, well, you ought to try like I'm trying. You know, that ought to be your responsibility. If that were the sermon that we preached, then your attention, your effort, your concentration would be on things below. It would be on fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil, concupiscence, and covetousness, not on Christ. Knowing that unless we have died to the law, we cannot live unto God. Oh, but Steve, surely you're, you're not telling me that that's... that's I thought to set our affections on things above would be to not do all that awful stuff. Listen to me, folks. Listen to me. There, there are so many strange paradoxes in the Word of God. The, one, the way up being down, one, one, you know, is it, it, it always seems to be backwards in what most people think. What do, what do I mean by the way up being down? I mean, that when we're weak is when we're strong. I've, I've always found it fascinating how that God will, you know, introduce these paradoxes that seem to go against, swim against the entire tide of the ecclesiastical system and everything that it teaches and everything that it believes. We don't gain victory by accomplishing it on our own, we gain victory by knowing that, that, well, God always causes us to triumph. So we're looking at fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil, so on and so forth. And that's just a part of the list. Mortify. That is, put to death, the text says, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, put them all off, verse 8, all. Go to, go to verse 8, look at, the, look at the text. Put them all off, all. Well, Steve, that means we've got to work at them a little at a time. Hack away at them, you know, like chopping down a tree, you know. You know, you just kind of hack away at them until finally you get to the end of, the, of your list and, well, you've made some progress, but, or seemingly, anyway, and, and then by the time you get to the end of it, you're back to the beginning doing the same things again that you thought that you got rid of when you began to try. Maybe I didn't say that right, but that's basically how that works. That's law. And the flesh profits nothing. We're to mortify, put to death, our members which are upon the earth. Put them all off, seeing that you have put off the old man and his deeds. Verse 9, you have. Romans 7, 4, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law, to the body, by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead. And I want you to take note of the word married, because... We're going to be looking at fornication here in the text, and I'm not going to discount the fact that physical fornication is not also involved in the text, but what I'm going to suggest is, is that in the mind of the Holy Spirit, given the context, we're looking at, first and foremost, we're looking at things which are spiritual, not physical, not fleshly. We're looking at spiritual fornication, which is having an endless flirtatious affair, love affair with the law when we are, in fact, married to another. Spiritual adultery. That's how Paul, or the Holy Spirit through Paul, describes spiritual adultery in the seventh chapter of the, of the book of Romans. So note the words married to because we're about to see the contrast to that. If, if you see, folks, in the fifth and the sixth verses here, the fact that you are under law, which you've never been, well, you've never been in the first place, so that you don't do these things, you don't do them because you're under law, then you've reached two very erroneous conclusions. The first is that your affections 
really ought to be in the area of law. And the second conclusion you've reached, which is greatly in error, is that by concentrating in this area, you can live unto God. Galatians, if, if you have not realized that you're dead under the law, you cannot, cannot, cannot live unto God. If you look at this, what we're looking at here, folks, as law, your affection is not on things above where Christ sits at the right hand of God. The fifth verse begins with an aorist imperative, not a present imperative. It is not a constant endeavor, not at all, not at all. It's an aorist imperative. Our old man has been crucified with Christ. We're being told to put to death once for all those things which stem from the sinful nature, the old man, the old self, which was crucified with Christ. We have put off the old man and we have put on Christ. Note the words, all these, in verse 8. All these, all at once. It isn't saying work on these things as you, as you walk in the flesh. That is law. You know, I've, I've been feeling like, uh, well, I wasn't a good enough Christian, so I brought my neighbor uh, some of Sue's homemade apple uh, butter, and that made me feel better about myself. So God must love me again. So I figure I, I put on at least a, a piece of that righteous robe today. I put on I put on a little bit of that new man. And, and and I reckon I ought to be proud of myself. But then shortly after that I got I got angry at him. So I had to take that that little bit of that little patch of white robe off and now I feel just as guilty as sin again. Maybe I'll do better tomorrow. That's legalism. That's law. Back and forth. No peace, no joy, no rest in Christ. We are to, in our experience, live as who we are. In our experience, put off the old man in its entirety and put on the new man in its entirety because that is what we've done. We have died been buried and raised with Christ, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man. It is a putting off and a putting on, a change of garments. We don't, we don't wear the old man, but the new. We, we can, you can put that old dirty garment back on anytime you want, folks, but that's not you. I, I thought long and hard yesterday. I thought, well, I, you know, I, I thought to myself when I'm, I even was talking to myself. I said, Steve, when you make this video, go and find the dirtiest garment that you can and put that on and then and find the cleanest one that you can and, and, and swap garments, you know, right in front of people. You know, take off the dirty shirt, put on the clean shirt. Maybe they'll get, maybe they'll get the point. I've never been one for theatrics. I don't, folks, I don't know what it takes to, to get it across to people that it is an exchanged life that we live. We give up, we, we, we give up our former way of life, which was just wallowing around in the garbage bin of life. And, and when I, when I, when I'm, when I say that, I'm not talking about, you know, all of those things that the church would often pre preach against, you know, forbid you from doing, like, you know, uh, just just fill in the blanks. Folks, our life is Christ, not self, Christ, not law, His works, not our own, uh, and you know what, the contrast that the, the, that the Holy Spirit has given us throughout the entire New Testament is so, they are, there are so many that, that take and separate, that draw that, that line between us and Christ, self and Christ, 
grace and law, the spirit and the flesh, that you would think that, well, you just think that there would, more Christians would come to understand that our affections are not set on things below. The word below describes all of that of which we once were. I'm not talking about being in the bar, okay, or, you know, all, all that, that old life that we used to live. I'm talking about in the religious sense. Folks, if you haven't learned anything, learn this. You can be in church and live according to the world, the flesh, the law, the, the filth, the garbage of the flesh, everything that God's judgment is coming against because it has nothing to do with Christ. It's all about trying to earn merit, earn favor with God, satisfy, appease some angry God, and they call that the Christian life. If you think, some of you, I know you get this, and if, and if, you, and if you're frustrated, well, maybe you've been frustrated longer than I have. I've been frustrated for 30 some odd years with this. We were born into a world, which I pointed out in other previous videos. I think we, we, we are born, we've been born into an apostate system that has abandoned Christ. The light's not on in the church, folks. Does God have His people there? Yes, He does. Many of our brothers and sisters are, are within that world system. But they're walking in it, but they're not living in it. That's not where they live. They are walking in an area in which they do not live. Christianity in the main would argue against this, accusing us of not taking God's commands seriously. Steve, this, it says we're not to do all this stuff, and, and, and man, we need to get busy here. God's laid out our, you know, He's made our to-do list here. And man, you can't, you can't argue against that. You can't ignore that. You're just preaching, you know, licentiousness. You can just, we can just live however we want. Folks, I'm not doing that at all you know, accusing us of not taking God's commands seriously. Are you kidding me? Look at the imperatives there, Steve, okay? But, you know, I, I won't even listen to the argument. And here's why. Because I don't see how that they can express such a concern for God's commands here, right here, while ignoring the fact that the very first command that you'll find in the epistles is in the sixth chapter of Romans, likewise reckon ye yourselves also to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. Do you really care about imperatives? Is what I would say. Do you, do you really care about God's commands? If you do, why are you ignoring the very first one that we were given in Romans? I can't tell you how many Christians I've met in the last 30 years who have, who have said to me, well, Steve, I tried that. I tried it over and over and over again. You know, it doesn't work. What doesn't work? Reckoning myself dead to sin. There, folks, there's no work in the verse. That would be exactly the same as coming to me and saying, Steve, I've tried and tried to reckon, you know, two plus two equals four, but it just, it don't work. What do you mean it doesn't work? It's true. There's no work involved. There's no commitment involved. There's no effort involved. The command that God gives you, the will of God that He wants you to see is to recognize as true what is true. You are dead to sin. If you're not, folks, if you're not dead to sin, you're headed for hell. If you belong to Christ, you are dead to sin. And the, the first imperative God gives us in the epistles, the very first one, one that's obviously it's supremely important to our loving Heavenly Father, is that you recognize as true what God has done. Yet the ecclesiastical community, the world religious system based on human merit, is tremendously involved in trying to become dead unto sin. 
Dead to sin seems to be defined as we no longer sin. Folks, that's not what that is saying. You reckon yourself dead to sin because you do sin. And how that highly educated men... Or maybe I shouldn't have... Maybe I shouldn't use the word educated. How that renowned Christian leaders, so many of them, that I respect can say that dead to sin means we try to no longer sin is beyond me. Ye have died, and your life is hid with the Christ in God, verse 3. The contrast continues. Set your affection on things above, not on the things that are on the earth. And if you look up the word covetous, and I've done this a couple of times in Bible studies, just 10 verses in the New Testament that have the word covetous. And this right here is the only place where it's articulated. The covetousness. And I believe the context bears out, screams out, in fact, that there is a covetousness which in, in the mind of the Holy Spirit pertains to those things which are beneath, the things on the earth. The Christian community would look with, with horror upon many of the, the immoral actions of God's people, and right, rightfully so. I, I would too. I am in no way suggesting that morality is not important in the Christian mind, folks. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not in any way suggesting that you go out and live any way you want to live. That you live in total disregard of God's character, His righteousness, His holiness. However, I am teaching that if your affection is not settled on things above, all the rest of the effort's wasted. Listen, folks, many of God's people have fallen into physical sin. I had a brother who fell into a great physical, you know, back into drug addiction. Who haven't fallen into spiritual adult, idolatry, spiritual adultery. Then they've been ostracized, expelled from the Christian community. Whereas many who are spiritually covetous, who live in spiritual adultery, that is, married to another, well, they're married to Christ, yet they're joined to another law. They're welcomed with open arms. I'm going to suggest to you that as I meditate on this passage of Scripture, it is impossible for me to suddenly leave the theme that's been there for two and a half chapters and suggest that we're now being given some kind of a moral preaching by the Holy Spirit so that we clean up the old man. The truth is that we're looking at a putting off the old man and a putting on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there's neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. It includes everybody. What are those things that are on the earth? They're the area of law. What is the area of law? It's the area of work. It's the area of the flesh. And here's an area to which you're dead. What are the things on the earth? They are a desperate attempt to present righteousness to God by man's effort. The area of the law. They're not the walk of the Spirit. It's, it's, because, of these things, it's because of these things that God's wrath comes. Ephesians says, comes upon the sons of disobedience. And you are not a son of disobedience. You never were. In Ephesians, you were told that at one time you lived like they did, and that's what you're going to be told here. 
But in neither passage of Scripture and no place else in the Word of God does it ever say that you was a son of disobedience. You lived like one. You lived like sons of disobedience. And you were disobedient children, but you have always been the sons of God from before the foundation of the world. Verse 5, do it once. It's a once for all counting, a once for all reckoning, not a continuous battle of putting to death the sins of the flesh by means of the flesh, but recognizing that the flesh profits nothing. Now, that, that doesn't just mean that which comes from the flesh profits nothing, but that the idea that the flesh overcomes the flesh, well, in my mind, it's nothing short of stupid, but it's Self will never cast out self, folks. The flesh will never cure the problem of the flesh. It's the very problem. The very, the very thing that God came to deliver Christians, His people from, the very, the very crux of the matter, the very problem in their lives, the very thing that He's delivering them from, they're taking and embracing that very thing to try to, to satisfy God, try to please God, try to earn merit with God. The very thing that He's delivering them from. Come, Lord Jesus. I just can't wait for You to come. Deliver me from this body of sin and death. And they go through their lives living, working, trying to earn merit, trying to earn favor with God with that same body that, that they can't wait to leave from. To depart from. In Ephesians, we were told that at one time we lived like they did, and that's what you're going to be told here. But it doesn't anywhere say that you were a son of disobedience. Law keeping, prophets, nothing. And this area of the flesh is that area in which the wrath of God comes. Even the two women in the book of Revelation display this contrast. The woman of Revelation 12 and the great harlot of chapter 17, I believe, 18, 19. And God is going to gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle and He's going to throw off that ecclesiastical system. This is the reason God's wrath is coming. Men arrayed in, in great robes and crowns and marvelous buildings and and can't help but remind me of the early days of, of, of our Lord. Where was God worshipped? Temple of Jerusalem. Who were the guardians of the truth? Well, the scribes, the Pharisees. Where was Christ? In Nazareth, Galilee, in the mud, muddy streets. Never, never once in all of His earthly ministry did, did He ever enter the naos, the temple, Yet He was the God of the temple, creator of heaven and earth. The very system that used His name, that guarded His word, translated that word with such care that today you and I can count supremely on the accuracy of their copies, refused to acknowledge Him. Amazing. That's why His wrath comes, not because the people in the slums of Jerusalem were living a low and beggarly life, fighting with one another and not getting along, but because the system that used His name was prost prostituted. You know, it prostituted itself to the nations of the earth. That's why His wrath comes. You used to walk in that. That's, what, that's where you used to walk. Verse 7, in the which you also were, walked sometime when you lived in it. It doesn't say there that you were a son of the devil, that you became by conversion a son of God. It says there was a time when you didn't know. Paul says that. I was alive apart from the law once. This is the system we're looking at here, law. I was alive apart from the law once. the things that are upon the earth. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. That, 
that verse 7, in, in which ye also walked sometime when you lived in them. Now he needed to be born again. He was born by the Word of God, now born by the Spirit of God. But now that's when Paul was born from above, when he came to know what God had done for him, separated from his mother's womb. He didn't know that for a long time. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was involved in that system. The very system that ignored Christ was the system in which Paul distinguished himself, but he was dead. But that doesn't mean that he's headed for hell. He's out of fellowship with God, but he thought he was in fellowship with God. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. You know, he excelled above members of his own nation. He knew the Word of God intimately. He himself declares by the leading of the Holy Spirit that he was dead out of fellowship with God. Romans chapter 8. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. Who's that addressed to? Children of the devil? Is that saying that you who are children of God, if you live after the flesh, you're going to go to hell? Absolutely not. You won't be in fellowship with God. You cannot live unto God unless you've died unto the law. Because, folks, that's where your affection will be. All the time. It won't be on Christ and what He did. It'll be on you and what you got to do. I don't know how to put it any simpler than that. And we can't serve two masters. The exhortation of our chapter is why walk in an area to which you are dead, an area in which you are no longer bound, in an area from which you no longer derive your life. You can do that, but why do it? That's the area that God's going to judge. That's the area against which His wrath comes. Why live in that area? I mean, you can, but you're not a part of it. And folks, I'm simply asking you to look at this context and decide whether or not God is giving us a rule book for how we, how we ought to conduct every thought and motive of our life, or whether we are contrasting the things that are on the earth and the things that are above. I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.